Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 77. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me is Sean Chappell, coming from Ramstar Games. And we're going to be talking about his new game, Hibernation, a tile land game about bees. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Sean. No, oh, Thanks for having me, Mark. Happy to be here. So... Yeah, you got this new game coming out. It's is this your first game published under Ramstar Games? It is. Yeah, it's it's our first game created as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, ultimately, it's really our it's our prototype. It's our test a test pilot program essentially. <laughs> Very nice. First, tell me about how uh, what hibernation is like. I mean, it's it's tile lane. I haven't got a chance to play it online. I know there's a tabletopia mod for it, but give me a rundown with how the game plays. Yeah, it's um, it is as you say, it's a tiling uh, strategy game. It's abstract strategy. It kind of has a an Othello base, uh, but it's hex- hexagonal rather than a grid. So the idea, the main the main mechanic in the game is to sandwich your opponent's tiles and then flip the ones that are caught in between over to your own, uh, because all of the um, all of the main tiles of the game are double sided, and ultimately the goal of the game is to have more of your tiles face up by the end and. On top of that, we've actually added in, because we themed the game around bees, uh, which was a product of actually just playtesting with a whole bunch of hexagons, it really kind of came to us that we figured that that theme would fit really well. Um, We added in specialty tiles to sort of switch up the game a little bit to give people a bit more of a robust playing experience and other avenues of attack when they wanted to play the game. So that they weren't relying on one sole mechanic the way that you do in, say, Othello or Go or, or things of this nature. So we've added in flower tiles, spare tiles, um, a pesticide tile, and beekeeper tiles. And all of them, while they perform the same mechanic on how you use them in the game, they have a ten- they all have different uh, actions that they perform. So that gives you more avenues of attack to to, to win the game. Yeah, and I was looking through the rules, and I mean, these these specialty tiles seem actually like significantly powerful. They can be. Uh, well, when we first started uh, test test playing it just ourselves, we actually recorded our sessions, and I went back through it and had a look at some of the the plays that we were making, and it turned out that while the specialty tiles do give you an added advantage in one way, actually just using the standard flip your opponent's tile move shifts tiles from their side to your side and it's like a double whammy so that actual mechanic is in the long run probably more powerful than any of the specialty tiles but the specialty tiles come with added bonuses so they stay in the game on the table and they end up becoming things like blockers and and allow you to sort of separate your side out from your enemy's side and try to defend yourself in different ways interesting and and you've mentioned Othello. Was that kind of the? I don't think I've played Othello, but I played a game uh, Pente, which I think is derived from it. Was that the starting point on the design? Was like was seeing okay, this is an interesting game, but what if it was on a hexagonal grid? Or was was the impetus somewhere else? No, the the idea actually um, in in a previous life, in a previous incarnation, I used to be a stainless steel fabricator. And a lot of my time was spent working on projects alone because that's just the way that the company was set up. So I would get all my parts and weld and polish and ship out a conveyor or a tank or something like that out of my my work bay. So it gave me a lot of time to sit and think. And as our gaming group grew and our game nights grew, I started thinking more board games while I had all this free time to myself. And Hibernation, which at that time I was calling Swarm, just because that's how the game kind of came across to me. It wasn't until sort of six or eight months into the design process that somebody said to me, hey, this is kind of like Othello. Do you know what the game, that game is? And I'm like, yeah, you know what? I do know what Othello is. And you're right. It had, it had never clued into me that we were sort of riffing off that mechanic. But there it was, you know, and, and people weren't wrong about that. So, But I don't feel bad about that. Othello is a pretty cool game. So, Yeah, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And, and uh, there's certainly a lot of you know, games always borrow from the games that came before and expand on them. Uh, I mean, it's it's almost impossible not to. 
I, th- I think it is, unless you have sort of a, I know that we, on our on our research into board games and things like that, when Magic the Gathering came out, that was kind of a, a bit of a game changer in the way that they presented card games and things like that. But uh, yeah, for the most part, you're not wrong. You know, everybody's kind of cherry picking a few things here and there and whatnot. And, you know, you put your spin on it, but it has appeared somewhere else before before your creation right so. yeah i mean yeah magic is is kind of a, a big turning point but even richard garfield says that he uh was inspired for that game from cosmic encounter right? the right. idea of having cards that change the rules of the game was like the fundamental design idea that he got from cosmic encounter uh that uh he wanted to implement in the game and he didn't actually realize how uh, how big or how original it would end up being. And even like, you know, in prob I mean, probably the newest, well, I don't know. There's in, in terms of big changes in the board game design world, there's dominion, but even that was uh, taking ideas from magic, the gathering from drafting in magic, the gathering and, and spun off from there. And then I guess the other big kind of innovation is legacy games, but that's just like, taking right. an idea from video games or, you know, and just applying it to the board game world. I mean, even even these big innovations have their seeds elsewhere, which I find interesting. And, you, and you know, ultimately, for anybody who is designing their own game, don't don't go out of your way to feel that you'd need to be super balls original. Don't reinvent the wheel and don't pull your hair out if your game does have similarities to something else because they all basically do. Um, it's um, it's the process of building. That's just, you know, this is how we've come up with the language that we're using today. Yesterday, somebody was speaking English. We learned it. We've added some things to it. And now we're speaking it ourselves and it will change tomorrow when somebody else picks it up and runs with it. So don't don't feel bad. I would you know, a bit of advice to, to fledgling gamers such as ourselves. I would, you know, yeah, yeah. make your game, make your game. And, Absolutely. You know. Absolutely. So, uh, you are not the only designer listed on, uh, the credits here for, for hibernation. It seems like this was originally your idea. Uh, yeah. how did, what was the process of, of getting other designers involved? Well, the, the, the core game was my idea. Um, as I'd mentioned, I came up with it at work one day. Uh, and what I did was I actually presented it to our my game group, uh, which is my, my wife, Kit, and our good friend, Sabrina. We've been meeting for a couple of years, uh, and it became a really um, regimented thing that every Friday night we get together, Sabrina is able to blow off her day job, we get to enjoy her company, and we get to play games. We um, And... Ultimately, we like we like any games that really bring us all together. So the three of us have a tendency to be rather cerebral and we need that um, we need that engagement. So we're really big fans of things like the exit games and the unlock games that really challenge your perceptions and and get you your logic uh, engaged in, in the problem solving skills and things like that. But um, I had this idea and it kind of led to more ideas. And eventually I brought hibernation to Sabrina and Kit and said, what do you think about us? Why don't we make our own game? We have the capacity here. We have the idea and we have the skill sets between the three of us to actually make it a real thing. So you know, I'm the, I'm the lead artist, at least on, on this one. Uh, but my, my co-designers, they have artistic skills as well. They're both better at the design side than I am. I don't think that way. So while I can do the realistic art, they can do the, the product design and the tile layout and all the rest of it. Uh, my wife, Kit Davin, she's an author. So she's written a whole series of books. So she's great with the, the copy side of things. And Sabrina is a maker. So she knows basically anything. If you have a cosplay costume that needs to get made, she can make it. If you need some 3D models printed out, she can print it out. She's got any toy under the sun you can think of. So we sort of, we married, I, I said, here's this idea. We have all the skills. Why don't we try it ourselves? And it just, it ran from there. Interesting. Interesting. Hmm. Uh, Cause that's, that's always a big uh, question, right? When you have a game idea is like, do we go down the route of self publishing or do we try to pitch it to uh, another publisher? It seems like you, you jumped head first into let's just publish this ourselves or was there discussion about trying to pitch it to another publisher yep 
Yeah, absolutely. We um, I, as we started designing it, and we got out a little bit into the into the game uh, board game playing space and started play testing. We met some other designers locally, and they were talking to us about that very thing. You know, you can keep control of your project and build a business and hope for the best. You know, do your work, do your due diligence, and see if it grows, or you can pitch it to an existing publisher already and have them pick it up for you. And for us, I think we're really, because we're somewhat independent and we have the skill sets already, we really wanted to, we want to try it ourselves. I'm really, I'm really curious to see the end result of all of this work and actually having the game printed and delivered to, to our backers and all the rest of it. And just actually going through all the stages of manufacturing and delivery and all of that as as much fun as it is to actually design the game, I want to learn every step I can about bringing that thing to life. And I think at that point, we'll sit down and sort of say, was this really an experience that we enjoyed? Or is it uh, is it something that we're going to have to, maybe we'll just be designers and we'll pass off our design ideas to, to publishers instead. At this point, I have a feeling that we are going to continue publishing our own our own games, just because I really am actually enjoying the, the process of all the steps and all the learning and seeing that thing that we put all of that effort into become a real game. That's, that's really going to be very, very satisfying. I think. Honestly, I think that's, that's a rare, I don't want to say talent, but rare uh, drive. I mean, other people I've talked to, even ones who, who did ultimately decide to self publish or, you know, to make their own publishing company and, and get it out there th through Kickstarter and everything. Most of them seem to, find that aspect of it, the actual nitty gritty, getting the publishing done to be not enjoyable, even if they ultimately think it's worth it. And I know other people, myself included, would not want to have any part of that. So I think, uh, you know, that's, that's, it's, it's cool to see someone who's, who's really enjoying that process. Cause I've heard it can be a grind. It can be frustrating. Uh, but it is. I, I, I would I will admit it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, you take it. You take it all, you know, and all three of us are basically wearing every hat. So and you've got to figure out, you know, a bit of distribution of labor and, and who's going to do what and when we're going to do it. And we've done many things over and over and over as we've learned and, and changed. So like our original Kickstarter campaign page. We didn't realize just how much work goes into a board game Kickstarter. I mean, it doesn't have to. You can really streamline it and make it very simple. Here's my game. Here's my pitch. Done. But the advice that we've received from several Facebook groups that we belong to are sort of, you need some people in the industry to play your game. Let's get some videos made. People want to see the social proof of what you're doing. You know, get out into the, get out into the community. You need to to chat with people, you have to bring your own people to the game, uh, to the Kickstarter platform and so on and so forth. So there's been a lot of building and a lot of changing again and again as we learn more and realize that we're, we're weak somewhere and we need to, to research again or perhaps go to somebody else to get a better quote or to figure out better shipping, uh, things of that nature. So there has been a lot of Going at it again and again, you have to be, I think you have to be pretty tenacious uh, to want to take it on the way that we have. Mm -hmm. In constructing the Kickstarter page, I find that interesting because I feel like even like I haven't been in the board game world that long necessarily, but even a couple years ago, I felt like there was a lot more variety in how Kickstarter pages look like. And I feel like mm -hmm. over the past few years, it's kind of, coalesced into a certain aesthetic yes is that something you notice from from your angle from your perspective that's like okay here's what a kickstarter looks like you'd have to do these things or else it's just going to look weird to people absolutely absolutely and uh, you know sort of i think that if you ignore that you ignore that you're at your peril uh, to a degree people are now expecting a certain level of um of again social awareness and engagement and information on your Kickstarter page. And if you're missing certain elements, then people are, are a little standoffish about backing. Um, from what I've learned, you know, Kickstarter, when it first started out, your project 
could be sort of 50% there and you could get on there and pitch your idea and it would get the backing that it needs. Now, especially with, with things such as board games, there is an expectation that you're pretty much finished, that you're, you're at 95% and that you've been able to create viable prototypes that have gone out into the world and you have a certain amount of financial backing in order to make that happen and so on and so forth. So yeah, I have noticed that there is a, almost like a uniformity that's happening around board game um, at Kickstarters and I can see it uh, in some Kickstarters that do really well and other ones when I look at their pages and I see that their their pitch is flagging and I can go straight down through their page and say, these are certain things that are missing. And that might be the reason why people are standoffish about backing. People have, have related to me that Kickstarter used to be about bringing intangible things to life. And now it's more like a presale site where you've already got that thing created. And now you're just looking to sell it before you actually have the money to create it. So... Yeah, it's it's become almost like an investing site where people will invest in your product, and then you can bring it to life. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and and along those lines, I've found. I'm curious what what like the common wisdom you received was vis a vis stretch goals because that seems to be a huge deal on a lot of Kickstarters. Uh, although I've seen some successful projects that didn't have any. It was here's the game. You know, yep. you you either back it or you don't. Uh, here you go, and they, they they've done well. And personally, I'm not a big fan of stretch goals. Although I I've only backed maybe five or six Kickstarters. Uh, I'm not a Kickstarter backing regular, uh, so maybe I'm not the audience that's going for. It. But I'm curious what 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 is the the information you've received about the necessity of stretch goals? That's it. Um, well, that's that you hit it on hit it on the head there. The idea of necessity. I think I think on an individual project, you really have to you have to gauge whether or not that's something you need to do. For us, uh, we're basically we have no stretch goals. Our game is complete. It's it is what it is. Uh, and if we do anything, the stretch goals are going to just be about making the game a little nicer. So perhaps giving a better finish on the tiles, or adding you know some spot gloss to the um, to the box, or perhaps we can make the the rule book a little bit more robust with some some you know maybe a, a bit of our journey. We can add in a few pages that will show how we got to where we got to, so on and so forth. I don't think that for us stretch goals really lend themselves well to our project, but for other ones, other bigger projects, tabletop RPGs, and so on and so forth, when the stretch goals are actually giving you extra extra play. Materials, extra cards, extra minis, extra play mats, so or more scenarios and things like that. I can understand that to a degree, as long as what is being added does add extra value to what the game is. It's not just adding more stuff. You know, it's it's giving you more robust gameplay, broader things to do, and newer things to do. Mm -hmm. one of the criticisms over stretch goals has been that people leave things out of the game that are actually necessary and they they hang the term stretch goals over these things to try to entice people to to back and those those sorts of things should be uh, you know the again the, the popular criticism is those things should be in the game they are part of your game put them in the game don't make them stretch goals you know because a lot of backers are, are wise to that and they're kind of standoffish and there's there's kind of a i think there's two sides of the fence really either you do stretch goals well and people love it or you're doing it poorly and people can smell it and they're like eh, i'm not sure about that yeah because i sometimes i look at some projects and i'm like man this is this seems like a really simple game but man all the stretch goals are going to make that game look so busy like people want them the minis they want the all these premium features and I love, you know, I'll, I'll take every day, you know, if you give me some like thicker cardboard or a better finish on it or uh, something like that as an added feature. But I mean, yeah. I, I could see like, you know, a game like yours easily falling into a trap of making it too busy just by having more quote unquote premium or fancy things when it's a game that needs that that wants a cleaner, simpler look. 
Absolutely. And there's something there's something to be said for being succinct in your design in having, uh, you know, we play all kinds of different games um, and some of them work really well with having a lot of mechanics and being fairly busy, such as um, the Harry Potter Hogwarts battle that we have. They add on some things, but they're all working within sort of the same universe. So nothing gets too crazy. You know, the, the mechanics add three hearts, lose three hearts, add add a lightning bolt, don't have a lightning bolt, so on and so forth. So anything that they're adding to the game doesn't necessarily make things too much busier. It just adds an, a little level of a, another level of challenge. Whereas um, some other games, they can really get uber complex like over the top we have jaws of the lion as well gloomhaven um and we love it but it really does get i mean it's got it's got a lot of things to remember it's got a lot of moving parts and uh <laughs> if you want to if you want to do the game justice and to try to play it the way that it's meant to be played it can be tough sometimes you're like oh three three turns ago i should have done x and that's now i've lost the game and oh can we go back and we can just try this again or uh, so on and so forth. So there, there is. I think that there is a bit. Um, there's a bit of wisdom to keeping things succinct. If you if you don't need the extra stuff, trim it off, you know, and make your game a little bit more pure. And and I think people will enjoy it a bit better. Mm -hmm. It makes it makes it easier to learn. It makes it easier to bring it to the table. It makes it easier just to get into it and have the fun. So yeah, uh, going back to uh, the design process for Hibernation. Um, so you, you had this idea, you brought it to your game group, turned into co-designers. How, how complete was the game then? And how much, uh, how much work did you do after that process of like, of, of getting to the game to where it is now? A lot. Wow. It's gone through, it's gone through a lot of changes. I, I was surprised. I did not, I had this simple idea for swarm. It was two sides, you flip tiles and the, the whole point of the game was to knock your opponent completely out. Done. Um, and then when I sat down with Kit and Sabrina, they suggested that we need some some extra. We need a, just a little bit more going on here. So they pulled from their experiences of like uh, telephone app type games, uh, things on their Android phones, and like Candy Crush, things of that nature that had specialty tiles or specialty gems or things that showed up to change up the gameplay. So we added those in as well, and those went through a process of how do the, how do these work? How are they going to change the gameplay? How do we make it so that they fit into the theme and they fit into the mechanics and sort of the universe that we're creating inside of this box? And they went through a lot of changes. Like we we first implemented the bear tile as a blocker for the end of a line of tiles, so that somebody couldn't put their B tile at the end of your B tiles and flip an entire line. So you have a block. But we quickly found out that you could get around that by just building your bees out to get to the first one in line right in front of the bear. And then it's it's pointless. It, you've negated it. So what we did instead was we we beefed it up so that any tiles that the bear tile is touching can now no longer be flipped. They're they're impervious to being touched and they end up being blockers themselves. So you can't play through them. So it, it changed as as we play tested and people kind of said, eh, this is kind of clunky. I'm not sure I would ever play this tile because it doesn't do much for me. We sort of realized, okay, well, we need to change that up. And that is kind of really how things progressed. And we we looked at all the different tiles and they were all going again in different directions. And we said, you know, we need to consolidate how they all work. So they all have the same mechanics. So you can... You can play them on either B, B tiles or beside B tiles or beside other specialty tiles. And they all work the same way. But the effect that they have is different. So with flower tiles, they flip all the tiles around them in a ring. So any B tiles that are not yours flip over. The bear tiles protect tiles in a ring. And then the pesticide tiles remove tiles in a ring, ultimately. And anything that becomes detached from the hive that you've built and they go into a discard pile. So we needed to really consolidate and make the mechanics streamlined. And we think it's actually made the game really easy to learn. And it's given it that bit of extra spice that will give people opportunities to, to find their own strategy to win. Mm -hmm. And how long was that process? How long has the game been uh, in development? Well, we started in the summer of 2019. 
Uh, and it has surprised me that it has gone through this journey for, for so long. We had hoped to bring it to Kickstarter in the spring of 2020, which was actually pretty, uh, pretty ambitious and, and not knowing the design processes as well as, you know, being complete noobs at this. Um, we realized looking back that we would never have been ready for a Kickstarter in the spring. And then, of course, COVID-19 came along. And all of our outreach, everything that we had organized got canceled. Absolutely every, like 95% of what we were trying to do was physical in-person outreach from conventions to uh, game cafes to game shops. Uh, we even had a tournament almost set up in a small town near us uh, with, you know, they have a, a, a group of 30 some odd people who meet in a Quonset hut once every two weeks or something like that. And they have a, a big game night. All of it gone overnight <laughs> it just canceled so we actually put the project on hold for a couple of months just to see if things would change and they didn't so ultimately we had to turn to the internet which was basically the only thing that we had left and start learning how to reach out and get involved with the game community through the internet then we hoped to kickstart in the fall of 2020 but as we got, as I as I mentioned before, Kickstarter, it, the Kickstarter page was, you know, they take a lot of time to build. It took me about a month to put it together. And then there were all these changes. And ultimately, by the time we, we presented it to certain groups on Facebook, they said that they didn't think that the numbers were, were strong enough for people to support it, that we were asking too much money for too little game and the shipping which is the big sticking point, the shipping was going to kill us. People are going to look at it and say, I'm not buying that and paying that type of shipping. So we postponed again until this spring. Uh, and ultimately, I think with the theme of the game, spring is a great time to bring it out. Bees and flowers and everything's warming up. So I think that the theme of the game will appeal to people in a, at least a seasonal sense. And yeah, we've actually been working really hard in the background to alleviate those concerns about shipping by making the game smaller now it makes our it makes our footprint and perhaps you know our our shelf presence a little smaller but what we've done is by consolidating the tiles and the box is we've made it really shipping friendly because it's basically all we have left at this point i i, I would speculate that for 2021 we're not going to see any live opportunities to to sell the game on apart from, say, our local game shops and things of that nature. Um, you know, I, I would love to get to Gen Con. We were hoping, I was really, I had my fingers crossed that they were going to find a way to make it happen in 2020, and it didn't happen. And again, just with the state of it, I don't think it's going to happen again this year. I think it'll be 2022 before we see serious live events coming back to us. Uh, but, you know, if they're going to, if they if they do it, if Gen Con, if you're listening, and and you're uh, willing to put it on this this year? I am willing to quarantine myself for two weeks in order to get there and and experience it. Uh, I was really looking forward to that. And, but yeah, so now we're now we're at this point. We've we've finally developed the game. It's play tested. It's really good. We think it's it's solid. And now it's just a matter of kind of that run up to our to our Kickstarter, which is on April thirteenth this year. Actually, I mean. A year and a half working on the game is actually the shortest amount of time I've had of anyone, uh, anyone right. on the podcast. Usually, ask that question like, "Oh man, I've been I first had the idea nine years ago, and yeah. uh, it's just now." <laughs> so, I mean, even though you feel like uh, it's been delayed, I mean, I think that's remarkably quick, uh, right. especially for uh, you know first first time publishing. That's that's pretty that's fantastic. That's a lot of dedication, uh, and I applaud you. I'm one of those lucky people, possibly lucky anyways. Uh, I'm do, I do this full time. So I have the time to invest in setting things up and talking to people and, and working in the background to talk to the manufacturer about our options and to talk to the shipping companies about our options and to get those things lined up. I don't have to wait for the weekend or, or hope that I have an evening free to, to get at it. I, I know that a lot of, you know, first time publishers, uh, that's that's what they're looking at. You know, it's it's a weekend project. It's a passion project. And that's why it takes, I'm sure that's why it takes so long uh, to get those things together. One of the um, uh, folks that I follow, you probably know as, as Dan Hughes with his Cora Quest mm -hmm. game, looking at him, I mean, he brought that, he created that and brought that out 
through uh, the lockdown, essentially. So within sort of six to eight months, he had developed this game and, and brought it to Kickstarter. So it is possible to do. I know that he had a lot of help, too. A lot of friends came out to, to give him support, which is great. Uh, and there's, you know, if there's anything to to all of this, it's it's build that community because they'll have your back when you have something, you know, when it, you have something new to, to develop or you've got a problem, you know, they'll be there to, to help save you. Mm-hmm. So it, it can be done, but I think you need the time to really put into it. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. So. Backing up uh, even further, I'm curious about what got you into modern board games uh, to begin with. Was there a particular game that hooked you uh, and started this game night? Or Yeah, well, um, our friend Sabrina has been more into into gaming longer than we have been. And although board games have been part of our, basically been part of my life since forever, uh, I can remember actually getting, when I was a, a, a young boy, my parents would basically get me a, an action figure for my birthday and a board game. That was, I was pretty much assured of getting one of those two things or, or both those things for my birthday. Uh, and I can remember playing games like IQ 2000 and another one that was like a, a car game. And it was, it was all about high octane and so on and so forth. They were all, you know roll and move type games really you know kitty type stuff and things like that yeah we actually really started getting into this a bit more with i believe the eldritch horror we picked that up and started playing that and realized just how far board games have come and that they are much more adult than they used to be you know um i've read a lot of posts that say roll and roll and move are pretty much kitty type games so please don't bring that to Kickstarter if, if you're looking for an adult audience. So <laughs> we're shying away from that as a mechanic if we uh, if we should decide to develop in that direction, unless it's for, for kids specifically. But yeah, it was that and our friend Sabrina, who's been into this space a little bit more, she, she brought over a game called Super Dungeon, which she had supported off of Kickstarter, which is this, it's expansive. She has buckets and buckets of parts because she bought the whole thing with with every expansion. and. Uh, it's got something like 200 different minis and she wants to someday paint them all. And I'm, I'm happy to help at some point if we ever get that sort of free time. But um, yeah, we, we really realized at that point just where games have gone. And since then, we've picked up a couple dozen new games and we've tried out all kinds of different mechanics. And, and I love it. I think it's great where, where board games have gone and the engagement that you can get with with adult friends or, you know, with your kids, depending on how old they are, to, you know, have that family time and to enjoy that that connection in a very different way. It's, it's great. We're actually going to be having our very first game night tomorrow night since before Christmas, because we've been under lockdown ever since then. So I don't think we've actually had a proper game night in about two months. And it's it's going to be a to do. We we picked up something new. We're going to be having nachos and breaking breaking all the all the dietary rules and <laughs> it's this. It. Let's have some fun, you know. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Mine mine are still digital right now, uh although the numbers the covid numbers are going down, so hopefully my my small friend group will uh be able to come over soon. We'll see. Absolutely. Something I really love about board games is the tactility of mm-hmm. board games of touching the parts some games have done fantastic things with what's what's available and i love seeing somebody come out with really beautiful pieces or beautiful minis or beautiful tokens or they've, they've got wonderful art design or they've taken something and now you can build you can actually build right on the i think photosynthesis is is one of those games where you build trees essentially mm-hmm. uh, i haven't had a chance to play it but i've seen pictures of it and it's like that's brilliant you know it's 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 two pieces of of thin cardboard but with a few slots you can actually make a 3d object and all of a sudden it makes gameplay a little bit more engaging and a bit more fun and there's i love that about it i love you know there's one thing for for video games uh and what what they can do for you but the tactility of a tabletop game i I don't think it can be beat i love that yeah and, and and certainly you know digital platforms you know tabletopia tabletop simulator board game arena have been a lifesaver you know when we've all been isolated but man there's you cannot replicate uh completely the enjoyment of just being around uh friends and playing with a physical game 
in front of you. Uh, Absolutely. It's, it's, there's something, something there uh, that, that's irreplaceable. Although I have uh, the plus side of digital gaming, of course, is that you can, you can get a lot more plays in more quickly. So there are certain games I've been just been my like relaxation games that I've gotten quite good at <laughs> right <laughs> during this time I, but I still want to I still want to bring out uh and sit around an actual table and and, and bring out our, our favorite games but hopefully that can start happening soon I hope so yeah um cuz yeah. you're you're up in Canada right yes yeah Cambridge Ontario okay yeah uh I haven't looked at, at how Canada is doing in terms of covid you you all didn't get hit as hard as the United States right we didn't. No, no. Um, I don't. I don't want want to get too political. But with the lockdowns that we've had here, I haven't really agreed with them so much. Our numbers have been really small, like com- comparatively speaking to um, to the U.S. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I find some of the <clears throat> some of the um, actions taken by our government a little bit stringent for for what our numbers truly are. You know. Mm-hmm. I'm missing the opportunities that have been stripped away from us because of the lockdowns. You know, I understand the reason for it and I, and I fully support, you know, keeping people safe, but I would still like the opportunity to visit a live event if we can make it safe. And if I, as a reasonable adult can take precautions afterwards to make sure that other people will be safe. If I should happen to bring something home, Mm -hmm. you know, I, and I'm, I'm sort of disappointed in the fact that the opportunities are gone. Right. Yeah. I think a lot's going to depend on how fast the vaccine can get rolled out and impl- and and there's some threshold of vaccination you hit yes. that that hits a critical point. I know. I don't know the details, but I'm seeing. I don't know. I'm seeing that at least in the U.S. we might be able to get there by summer. I don't know. I I too am hoping that like you know my my one of my favorite conventions is uh, PAX Unplugged in early December, or late November. I still right. got my fingers crossed a little bit for that one. Yeah, uh, we were we were looking at that one as well. That's um, that's Pennsylvania, right? Yeah, in Philadelphia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we I, looking... I love that convention. It's really good. Nice. Yeah, we had the opportunity actually before um, back in, in 2019. There were a couple of conventions up here. Uh, one of them is called Proto To. And it's um, a prototyping convention held in Toronto. And that was where I actually first started meeting some of the, the local board game community. And funny enough, we actually met all kinds of Americans as well. A lot of people came across the border to, to join up uh, with a, this prototyping convention. And there were all kinds of games in all stages of development. Some were just on paper and they were being torn apart at the table as people made suggestions. And why do we change this and change that? Okay. Break out a, a fresh pack of blank cards. Let's start writing on things. And other things, other games were basically finished. And it was, you know, we're working on the copy on the cards. Do you think that the words make sense? You know, the mechanics are done, but, you know, are you getting lost with the way that we've we're, we've worded things? Or does it work? And that, um, that was great. I really enjoyed um, doing that sort of convention. I was really looking forward to more of that. And I'm sure that PAX Unplugged is just a bigger version of, that here's here's all of our ideas come play come yeah i mean in terms of like new like you know games under development i mean there's an entire room or two just dedicated to that like uh hosted by unplug or or, sorry hosted by um unpub right is that the organization i believe i'm not sure there's an organization that that does that sort of thing uh and there's a room constantly going rotating new games in and out and uh, nice. Just a big convention floor, but yeah, I mean, it seems like you you feel like you've missed a lot with uh, conventions shutting down, which which I think is is interesting because right because you're 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 hosting you're doing the initial sale on Kickstarter, which is you know fundamentally an online platform. But do you feel like the in person element in terms of marketing is important of going to conventions, or is it more of you feel like you're missing? critical play testing development resources by the lack of conventions. I think it's all of that, to be honest with you. I think that um, conventions, uh, I know that I, I've never actually been to a board game convention specifically, but I've been to other ones as, um, as an artist. I've been an artist alley for Fan Expo uh, in Toronto and a Montreal Comic Con and a few of the other bigger, bigger shows. And there are so many 
things that are going on. You're meeting other vendors and other people doing things that you do. And so you're making contacts in the industry. And then if you do have play tests, if you have things that you're, you're trying to get opinions on, you can present that as well. There's opportunity for that. And then, of course, those people. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I like to say to people is that you're always marketing. It doesn't really matter what you're doing. If you're talking to somebody about your game, you're in a sense marketing that game because now you're talking, you're telling somebody new about what you're doing. And so I think that there's better opportunities to market, to meet your crowd, to shake those hands, to show a smile, to get involved in the community. And I think conventions really fit that bill perfectly. Um, one of the one of the struggles that we've we found online is trying to find the right people to present our game to. And when you have a convention that's specifically for board games, you've got those people in a fishbowl, essentially. They're they're looking for you. You know, you've shown up on the day and they're looking for you uh, rather than the other way around. And we found that very difficult. While we can find places where people are playing board games, trying to find those specific people who will really enjoy what we have to offer has been tough. Because now that we're all on the Internet, everything's scattered and with sort of Facebook ads and things, you can pick and choose your demographics and pick and choose your countries and hope for the best. But when you have a convention where people who are enthusiasts of what you're offering are already coming, it's so that's so much easier. Mm-hmm. I would rather pay $1,000 for a booth at Gen Con than to pay $1,000 to Facebook ads and run a big ass campaign. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's just it's better in the long run. That personal touch makes all the difference. It really does. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully conventions can get back uh, in the next few months. We'll see. Fingers crossed. I hope so. I sure hope so. Uh, So you mentioned the Kickstarter is going up uh, soon. What's the date on that? Uh, April 13th. Funny enough, um, it actually happens to be my birthday as well. So it's going to be a good day. I hope. (laughs) Let's hope so. And then yeah. the game is called Hivernation with a V. Yeah. And uh, what's the price going to be? Uh, at the moment, we're we're shooting for somewhere between twenty and twenty five. Okay. US. Uh, we haven't quite settled on a price just yet. I kind of need to throw it out to to a few people and sort of say, you know, what do you think is reasonable? Mm-hmm. Um, but we think that we have a, a, a product that's good in that price range. Uh, any more than that, I think people are going to look at it and say there's not enough game for what you're asking. Uh, but anything less than that, and I think we're, we'll, we'll be underselling it mm-hmm. for what it is. So Awesome. Any yeah. last notes, comments, selling points for Hibernation? Well, ultimately, um, I think it's a really great gateway game. Uh, we, we, I've heard some people talking about this idea of you know gateway games. Uh, and, and we think that we've created something that is good for that. So if anybody's sitting on the fence about maybe getting into to board gaming. I'd invite you to come have a look at what we've what we've created because it's a fairly it takes 30 seconds to set up. It takes a couple of minutes to learn. You can get right engaged in into into gameplay right away. But it's really hard to master because you're ultimately you're playing whoever's across the table from you. It's one of those it's like chess, you know, everybody knows what the moves are, but if the person across the table from you is much better at it, then that's what you're really playing. You're playing your opponent. So I think that our, our game has that opportunity to constantly be one of those strategic games where you learn a little more and you play a little better and you play somebody who's better than you. And it, it, it'll always have that continuous engagement. But it's not so rule heavy that you have to spend three hours reading the rule book or going back to it again and again and again to see if you're doing it right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there's that. And ultimately, I would ask anybody listening to come check us out. And if you feel it's the kind of game that you want to keep that conversation running on, uh, sign up for our newsletter. Let us continue that conversation with you so we can let you know what we're up to. And uh, where can they find information? Oh, uh, we are basically everywhere. So we're firing in all directions. Uh, (laughs) uh, We're at uh, ramstargames.com. Of course, that's our main website where you can find out everything that we're up to. we're also on Instagram. We have a, a Facebook group for Hibernation specifically. You can uh, come see us there and, and ask to join up and help us create Hibernation. That's where we post a lot of, should we go with this picture? Should we go with that picture? What do you think of this box design? Do you like this idea? So on and so forth. So if you want to be part of the process, we're happy to have you give us a hand and, and be part of the community. 
Uh, and then, yeah, ultimately, yeah, general social media channels, you can find us everywhere. Fantastic. Yeah, I'll, I'll say, I mean, I haven't got a chance to play it. There's the Tabletopia uh, mod up if you have Tabletopia yep. uh, and want to give it a try. But just reading through the rules, it does seem like a really cool abstract game. Uh, and I, I, I've, like I said, I've pl- I haven't played Othello. I've played Pente, which has a similar thing of trying to put your pieces on either end of like a column or a row. And I find that kind of what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, th- that kind of spatial abstract game to be to be quite compelling. So I'm excited to give it a shot on Tabletopia. Again, the Kickstarter is going up on April 13th. You got it. Awesome. I remembered the date. Yay, me. Yeah. And thanks, Sean, for coming on the podcast. This was a really fascinating look at just that process of getting a game to this point, which uh, I always seem, uh, for me, it seems like an incredibly daunting task for you. seems like it was a lot of work, but I, I seem to have a really good handle on it. It is, it is a lot of work. But uh, one of the things I would, I would suggest is just relax into the process. You're going to change a lot of things. You're going to learn a lot of things. You're going to relearn a lot of things. And uh, one of the, one of the what we're really looking forward to is once hibernation has has funded and it's it's in that process of being manufactured. We know that for the next game because we do have a second one actually in the background that we're already pre planning. We're going to have a lot of foundation set. We're going to have the understanding of how a game begins to how it finishes. And so for the next one, I think a lot of the stress will be off. It'll be about designing a great game and not worrying about how we set up the avenues of disseminating that game out to the world. We'll know all that. Mm-hmm. So we're looking forward to that. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Well, I know well I now I got to ask about this, the second game. Is there any, are, are you keeping, oh. <laughs> keeping information about that sealed or? No, I, I, well, I mean, there's always, should I, should I say anything? Should I not say anything? You know, uh, <laughs> Uh, but ultimately, yeah, the, the, the working title of the game, it's called The Dirty Dozen. Uh, it is an egg-themed game. Uh, as you can, I don't know if you can see the artwork behind me there, but that's that's me. That's what I, I do oh, as wow. a fine artist. That's fantastic. So I, I had this idea once uh, for a fine art project, which was all about eggs. And I looked at them as being the beginning of life. They're pure. They're innocent. Um, they're They're beautiful, this beginning of life. And I thought, why don't we put the most disgusting, grossest things inside those eggs and really ruin it for everybody? So <laughs> <laughs> I, I came up with a series of paintings. Uh, one of them was like there was a squid coming out of it and it's tearing at the fabric of its own reality. So it would be pulling back the edge of the painting. And another one was uh, The Funk of 40,000 Years from Michael Jackson's Thriller. Uh, another one was a bit more biblical. It was the 30 pieces of silver that Judas got, so on and so forth. So all these awful things inside these beautiful eggs, sort of the unexpected. And that's what uh, we're riffing off of for The Dirty Dozen. It's basically going to be an egg-themed game where you need to come up with the most evil, rottenest dozen eggs in front of you as you can get and it's going to be kind of cult themes with a few um i think earth earth based uh, motifs so fire earth air water that kind of idea and we're going to stick with the animal realm again so you know the the characters that you play are going to be animals and it's some um, it's a card game but we're trying to make it a little bit more than just uh say like an exploding kittens type thing or an unstable unicorn type thing where there's a there's a bit more involvement and again players will have more than one avenue of attack to get to the end goal if they like playing offensively defensively sneakily so on and so forth there will be options so it's going to be fun uh, i picked up an ipad to start learning how to do digital art because everything that I've done in the past has been even the art for, for, for hibernation was done with an airbrush uh, and, and paint brushes. I did that physically. And now trying to change those designs afterwards is a pain in the butt. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. <laughs> so I, I would recommend if you have the opportunity, I know that a lot of people do hand drawn stuff and that's fine. I'm not saying don't do that, but uh, the digital stuff, you can change it. So don't discount it. You know, if you like the physical stuff, the digital stuff might be easier in the long run. 
And with this game that we're that we're developing gently in the background, it's going to have something like a hundred different designs. Hibernation has fourteen, and that took forever to put those together on the side. Whereas you know, a hundred designs that's going to be that's going to take some time. So we we I have to be really organized with how I produce those, so that it doesn't take three years to to bring the game to market. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, wow. I think people are really going to like it. It's a, it's a, a unique. I have unique ideas, and I hope that people enjoy what we come up with. I think they will. Yeah, it sounds interesting to me for sure. Um, hmm. And I and I love games that have unique art and explore more wild ideas, you, even if uh, just visually. Um, that's really cool. Um, hmm. Great. Well, we're looking forward to that. But right now, Hibernation is the game to check out. So go to ramstargames.com for that. Thanks for listening, everybody. As always, you can go to thethoughtfulgamer.com for anything I'm doing. I'm also on social media, uh, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And if you'd like to support the podcast and get all kinds of cool rewards, including watching the recording of podcasts live, go to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye.